This is Radio 4, and now conversations with historians. John Miller meets several eminent historians to discuss their work, why they were drawn to it, and why they feel it's relevant to the modern world. Christopher Hill decided to become an historian when his other ambitions, to be parliamentary correspondent for the BBC and to reform the real world, didn't seem to be getting anywhere. But the analytical brilliance of his work on the 17th century brought him academic renown and eventually the mastership of Balliol College, Oxford. It's not perhaps surprising that he should have been drawn to study the great battle between Parliament and Crown that led to the Civil War and transformed the way in which this country is governed. What is more unexpected is who actually triggered Professor Hill's fascination with the English Revolution. I was greatly influenced by T.S. Eliot on metaphysical poetry and was very much into metaphysical poetry and in order to understand metaphysical poetry I wanted to understand the society which produced it and the contradictions and conflicts which I thought I saw in metaphysical poetry fitted in with an interest in Marxism which I was developing I suppose for contemporary political reasons rather than academic, the two went together. So I can say in a way it was T.S. Eliot who drove me both to the 17th century and to Marxism, <laughs> which is a thing I like to say to people who don't expect me to say that. Why was it the decisive century in English history? Well, it was the century in which we had our French Revolution, so to speak. I mean, the French Revolution is decisive in French history, and I think the English Revolution is equally decisive in English history. It changed the whole nature of the society and its government. If the rest of Europe had not at the same time been riven by breakdown, revolt and war, might those powers have intervened in our civil war? Yes, I think they might very well. We were saved from intervention by the fact the Thirty Years' War was going on, 1618 to 48, it stopped just when ours was coming to a conclusion. I think there would certainly have been intervention, and then that would have made all sorts of differences. For instance, we'd have had something like a terror in England, I think, if and everybody says the difference between the English and the French and Russian revolutions is the nice English didn't have terror and nasty things like that. Well, we didn't have nasty things like that because there was no foreign intervention. I was struck that after 1599, all histories had to be authorised by a privy mm. councillor. Why did James I try to suppress Raleigh's history of the world? He said it was saucy about princes, and he didn't treat them with tremendous deference. He said what he thought about people. But of course, Raleigh was a rather way out character anyway, I and mean, he thought to have the wrong views on all sorts of things. His theology was suspect, and he was a danger to James I's policy of appeasing Spain and having agreement with Spain. So there were all sorts of reasons from him being hostile to Raleigh. But both Francis Bacon and Raleigh were thought to undermine belief in the old order. Yes, though Bacon didn't do it as provocatively as Raleigh did. I mean, Bacon smoothed the edges all the time and had a soft government job all the time and wanted very much to get the changes in the old order that he wanted through the government and not through anything else, whereas Raleigh, I think, was more realistic about it. I don't think he thought that was on with James, as it wasn't. They were both admirers of James I's brilliant eldest son, Henry, and you say his early death in 1612 marked the end of an epoch. What did you mean by that? Well, if he had remained heir to the throne, well, it's difficult to say, but he was already, as in the 18th century, the heir to the throne was always the, the centre of opposition, and opposition groups in the 18th century used to gather around the heir to the throne. They were starting to do that in James's reign with Henry. He took a strong pro-Protestant line. He wanted England to take a much tougher line in the religious struggles on the continent to support our Protestant brethren there. And when the Thirty Years' War came, if he'd been heir to the throne, he'd certainly have been extremely dissatisfied with James's policy of non-intervention and would have, one suspects, I mean, it's all guesswork, of course, taken the lead in trying to get it changed. If Henry had lived to succeed his father, might the Civil War have been avoided? 
you can't conduct that sort of experiment, rerun history to see what has happened if you change some of, of the factors. I mean, I've not the faintest idea. There'd be more chance of it having been avoided, I think. I mean, we can see now that all the conflicts of the 17th century were leading up to something like 1688 with a crown subordinated to Parliament, and that sort of a settlement could, in theory, have happened any time. For instance, during the Civil War itself, there were several occasions when there are negotiations between the King and Parliament for a settlement, which looks very like 88. It could have happened, and it could have happened peacefully earlier if Henry, let's say, had succeeded in 1625 and cooperated with Parliament on an expansionist foreign policy, and they voted him taxes. Well, that particular conflict over control of taxation wouldn't have arisen. In the century of revolution, you quote Charles I as saying, people are governed by the pulpit more than the sword in time of peace. Religion it is that keeps the subject in obedience. Was he right to believe that? Yes, I think so. Ever since the Reformation, the church in England had been much more associated with the monarchy than anywhere else, I think. The expressed idea was to have in every parish in the country an educated parson who'd been at Oxford or Cambridge and so hadn't a dangerous idea in his head who would guide the reading of the Bible which his congregation were undertaking. See, the Bible in English was tremendously new in the 16th century. It took quite a time for it to get across. But by the end of the 16th century, an awful lot of people are reading the Bible. And of course, there's a great deal in the Bible, including a a lot of anti-monarchical stuff, and a lot of democratic stuff, as well as stuff you can use on the other side. But people were using and discussing the Bible, and this is one thing that we call nonconformity and sectarianism. People were forming into groups, illegal and underground, before 1640, but they all came up after 1640. Charles's problem was to keep this under some sort of control. It was very difficult. Most European countries, you had an inquisition which looked after nasty people like that and nasty ideas like that. There wasn't anything like that in England. And because of the history of the English Reformation, the Inquisition was a very dirty word indeed, and Catholicism through the burnings of Protestants in Mary's reign was associated with cruelty and political repression. And so it was always rather dicey to do too much of that in England. The last public burnings for heresy took place in 1612, and the government decided this wasn't a good idea anymore because too many people sympathized with the people being burnt. So that there was a great deal of need for controlling the discussion, which all burst out into the open in the 1640s, most extraordinary outburst of public discussion there's ever been in England, and all control broke down. But at what point did the Civil War become inevitable? I don't know the answer to that. And I think Charles could have done a deal any time. I mean, in 1640, when he called Parliament, he could have done a deal, and if he had done a deal, but it would have been a deal at a price much higher than he was prepared to pay. I think he was exceptionally stupid or exceptionally high-principled man, whichever way you like to look at it, but he had certain things that he just wasn't going to surrender to and he wasn't going to be dictated to. Why did Cromwell rise to his position of preeminence? Was it his military or his political skill? Well, it's a combination of the t two, I think, and, yes, it, well, political skills and the fact that he stood for something very different from the old regime. The important thing about his army was that, unlike any other army, he encouraged free discussion and encouraged promotion by merit, which was a sort of unheard of thing in the 17th century. You only commanded a regiment if you were a pretty important gentleman. I mean, it was just entirely a social thing. A lot of people thought Parliament couldn't have got an army to fight the Civil War if they hadn't got the Earl of Essex to, to command it. You had to have a peer to command your armies. It was a social thing. And Cromwell just scrubbed all that and said... Pfft. In your book about Cromwell, God's Englishman, you exonerate him of the blame for the destruction of stained glass and images in the churches. 
Has his name been so blackened by contemporary and later historians that it's difficult to gain a true picture of him now? Well, the popular image is obviously rather difficult to change. I talked to my grandson who discovered that I was interested in 17th century history. He, he told me they were starting to do Cromwell at school. So I said, well, what do you know about Cromwell? And he said, oh, he was against fun, wasn't he? That's the only bloody thing he knew about Cromwell, I mean, for God's sake. Now, this image of the starched Puritan who's against fun is very, very strong still in sort of non-academic levels. It's dead at the academic level, obviously, but it's still a very strong feeling, and Cromwell has suffered for it. Cromwell always seems to have stood out from all the others, though, in all sorts of ways, and you said that only he could ride the two horses, the Parliament and the army. Well, only he could command the army, because he had this tremendous loyalty in the army, and by the mid-1650s, of course, he, he, he'd been appointing all the officers, so if, if there were any people in his army who weren't mad keen on him, he'd, he'd had the chance to get rid of him. So uh, the problem in the 50s was to get an accommodation between gentry and merchants whom Parliament represented and the army, which had power, which had taken power and couldn't be got out of power easily unless Parliament could produce an army of its own, which it couldn't. When Parliament fell out with the new model army after the Civil War, why did Cromwell wait before throwing in his lot with the army? Well, there are two views on that. I think they really amount to the same thing. He was seeking the Lord. He wanted to know what God thought was right. But seeking the Lord involved finding out who was going to win. If you knew who was going to win, then you knew what God wanted. I mean, it sounds cynical, but uh, it's a 50-50 sort of thing, I think. He wanted to be sure that his going over to the army wouldn't wreck the parliamentarian cause. God didn't want that. So he had to take soundings and find out what Lambert thought and what Harrison thought and what other people thought. I, I, I think this was a perfectly genuine... Thing, this seeking the Lord involved weighing things up so as to be absolutely sure what you wanted was going to be successful because you mustn't let the Lord's cause down. And if he'd gone to the army before he was sure of this and had mucked things up and caused a disastrous public split between the parliament and army, that would have been very, very bad for the cause that he believed in. So it's not just cynical opportunism, I think, it's trusting in God and keeping your powder dry. He wanted his powder to remain dry. He was accused by embittered associates of dissembling and lying. Yes. I, I, I'm pretty sure he did. I think his first political objective was to keep the army united, and that involved a good deal of dissembling every now and then. For instance, the execution of the king. A lot of people in the army wanted it, but of course others didn't, so there was tremendous sort of hoo-hawing. And, and earlier in the Putney debates, he had profound disagreements with levelers and agitators and some officers there who wanted a much more radical constitution than the one that Cromwell was prepared to accept. How far did he tolerate religious dissent? Very, very widely indeed, I think. I mean, most exceptionally widely for his times. And one of the interesting things is that when he's Lord Protector, he has all sorts of very interesting interviews which have been recorded with people way out of his own line of thinking and people whom he knew disagreed with him. He had interviews with George Fox and other Quakers and said to Fox, possibly insincerely, if you and I got together a bit more often, we could come to an agreement. <laughs> they never did, of course, and this may have just been a polite way of saying goodbye, but they had long discussions, and he listened to all Fox's vicious denunciations of him for not having led the armies into France and Italy to overthrow the Pope and overthrow the King of Spain. The Quakers weren't very pacifist in those days. And he was urging, on this one, he was urging moderation on Fox. And Fox was urging 
militancy on him. But he discussed in the way that, on the whole, rulers didn't in the 17th century. They didn't let ordinary people come in and have a discussion with them. Hey, they were too busy, I thought John Major doesn't let any <laughs> any loony come in and have a discussion to tell him what to do. He got plenty of them within his own party. He doesn't need stray people from outside. But Cromwell was very accessible in that sort of way. I think he was genuinely tolerant. Was it Cromwell, essentially, who decided after the Second Civil War that there was no alternative to the execution of the king? I think it was forced on him. I think this is one of the occasions when he thought he had to do something in order to preserve the unity of the army. There was a tremendously strong feeling in the army. And this was a theological feeling. You know, of course, the text in Numbers 35, 13, which they all quoted on this occasion, that if blood has been shed, the guilt will fall on the land unless the shedder of the blood is punished. And they took this very seriously, the rank and file of the army particularly. Well, there's been an awful lot of blood shed in England. Who was responsible? But his supporters were divided over that decision. His supporters were divided, but enough of them said that Charles I was the man of blood who must be brought to justice or were equally responsible and God will punish all of us. And I think it was a rational decision to say that if we don't do this, we shan't keep the army united and there is a danger that the levelers or other radicals will lead a successful revolt in the army because this was a red-hot issue for rather naive reasons. And people read the Bible, took it very seriously. This is what the Bible quite clearly said. No getting around the text. But is it true that some men died of heart failure when they heard of yes. the execution? <laughs> oh, yes. Well, I don't know if it's true, but it's plausible, I think. Oh, a lot of people are absolutely horrified. The people who died of heart attack, if they w were any, were old gentlemen who'd been loyal to the monarchy all their lives and couldn't understand what this was about at all. The people who were exercised by it were people in the army who had done the fighting, who had blood on their hands, and they wanted to get it off. I think that they really genuinely did feel that God might punish them and England if they didn't bring the king to justice. It seems to us an irrational way of proceeding, but the Bible was truth in those days. But not long after the king's execution, what you called the English Revolution turned conservative. Was yeah. that inevitable? Well, the execution of the king obviously was done by a minority. And it was done to keep the army together. It said, if they can do this to me, they can do it to anybody. It's a very difficult argument to refute. And so the reality of military dictatorship was brought home to everybody, I think, by the execution of the king. It clearly was an act of military violence, however they tried to dress it up as a court of law and so on. It wasn't. It couldn't be, and Charles made, did, made these points very skillfully in his trial. It's the most skillful thing he ever did. I mean, Milton jeered at him as the royal actor, but he acted his part extremely well at his trial and execution, and this had a great deal, I think, to do with saving the monarchy. But it worked because by 1649, this bloody expensive army, which was paid for by taxation, seemed as though it was settling in to stay there for good. The Civil War, among other reasons, had started because Charles was thought to have overtaxed the country illegally without consent of Parliament. In fact, you say that Cromwell's army had as little respect for the sovereignty of Parliament as Charles I. Yes, that's true. Reluctantly. I mean, that they'd have preferred Parliament to have agreed with them, but it didn't. Uh, I, I think an awful a lot of them really did believe they were God's agents. After Cromwell was proclaimed Lord Protector at the end of 1653, he never relinquished power to later Parliaments, did he? 
So, he, I think he generally wanted to. I think he was trying to do a deal. What he thought was an acceptable deal didn't seem acceptable to Parliament. Is it true he would have accepted the Crown if the army hadn't forced him to refuse it? I think it's quite possible. Again, one doesn't ever know what would have happened if <laughs> I cage you about this all, all, all the time. But I think... He did, I'm quite sure he didn't care about a feather in, in his cap, as he called it. And in fact, if he'd accepted the crown, he'd probably have had less power than he had as Lord Protector. Lord Protector, he, he, he ruled under the constitution he had made. If he'd become king, he'd have been under the old constitution as interpreted by the long parliament, which had put all sorts of restraints on the monarchy. So he'd have had less power, I think. But I think he, if he thought that was the price of a settlement with the Parliament, I think he would have accepted it, yes. His period has been called the Interregnum, but you've argued that the reigns of Charles II and James II should instead be regarded as an interlude. Yes. I think the euphoria of 1660 was very soon dissolved and didn't really correspond to anything very real because the Restoration settlement didn't really define an awful lot of the real issues. Nothing was made clear in 1660. What people wanted in 1660 was to get rid of the army quickly. That was the all-important thing. To bring Charles back so as to have enough royalist support to isolate the army. And the army, of course, had to be disbanded because people stopped paying taxes. Just as in 1640 they'd stopped paying Taxes in 1660, people refused to pay taxes, and the army hadn't any money at all. So when we look back at Cromwell, what should we think of as his legacy? Well, I think English foreign policy was completely transformed, not because of him, but because of the events which he presided over. And I think England became a great naval power from the 1660s. 50s, and that determined our role in the world for the next 200 years. I think the other thing that was decisive for later history about the Interregnum is the free discussion which went on in the 40s, and which he did very little to curtail. Of course, the, the Restoration government wasn't able to restore anything like the pre-1640 Order. Would you argue that the new social order post-1660 could not have been won without a revolution? Could not. I don't like could not. I think it was going to come. I would answer with Marvell, I think. He said the good old cause was too good to have been fought for. People should have seen that this was the right thing to do, and if it had been left to... King Charles, he would have seen it. Well, of course, that, the last bit's totally untrue. King Charles was too bloody high-minded or prejudiced, whichever you like to see it. But I think Marvel's point that the balance of property in the country was such that in order to have stable government, you had to have power lying with the taxpayers and not with an arbitrary king who can disrupt the economy by arbitrary tax collecting. Do you also say that in comparison with the French Revolution, the English Revolution stopped halfway. Yes. Well, for instance, it didn't give the land to the peasantry. And that's the, the big difference, I think. England is made absolutely safe for big landowners, whereas the French Revolution made France safe for small landowners. I think that's a very important distinction. And the peasant interest, of course, is still very, very important in French politics. And when you come to have a common agricultural policy, it has rather different views from England. Your last sentence in the English Revolution says, we still have much to learn from the 17th century. What should we try to learn? Well, uh, we haven't abolished the monarchy or the House of Lords yet. And that would be a good thing, I think. Although the, the House of Lords is being discussed and, uh, and, and made representative. I mean, that would be one thing. We haven't disestablished the Church of England as they did in the mid-17th century. I think a lot of people in the Church of England think that would be a good thing today. In England, there's still what you can see as survivals of feudal power and feudal wealth, if you like to put it like this. It's exercised by different people. I mean, the peers today are 
or newspaper proprietors and big businessmen, they, they aren't feudal landowners, but the structure of society and the snobbism of English society, which is still greater than one would wish, is something that could have been cleared up if the English Revolution in the 17th century had gone a bit further. I'm not saying it could have done in terms of the balance of forces then, but that's something we might learn. I think the levels were more democratic than most present-day English politicians who accept far too much of the old order. Why do you say all history should be cultural history and the best history is? Well, I'm very much against the historians who isolate certain chunks of history, like there's a great fashion these days for demographic history. Now, some people think you can write the history of a country in terms of its demography, and when population increases, there's inflation, and this produces all sorts of things. But this seems to me to leave out the whole human element involved and the lives of individuals in Involved, and to make history pretty meaningless as an understanding of the past. You've always been a Marxist historian and said you remained one when you tore up your party card in 1956. Why was that? What do you mean, how was that? Well, why did you say that you still, although you were no longer a member of the Communist Party, you remained a Marxist historian? Well, I suppose what I mean is I don't think as quite a lot of people say today that what happened in Eastern Europe in the last two years disproves Marxism. I see no connection whatsoever between the two things. I mean, what happened in Eastern Europe was disastrous and ghastly, but it no longer disproves Marxism than the Spanish Inquisition disproves Christianity. I mean, it was produced, the Inquisition came into existence in a Christian society, but it's not Christianity. And if I were a Catholic Christian, I wouldn't think this caused any doubts whatsoever in my acceptance of the general principles of Christianity. Marxism is an approach to history of Britain, advances certain hypotheses which I find interesting and useful. As far as I'm concerned, it's got no nothing to do with any system of government. And uh, I just don't accept the correlation it's an easy one for people to throw at chaps like me, and one has to do a bit of explaining. But after all, it's 35, 34 years since I left the Communist Party. I don't take any responsibility for it or for any other Communist Party. And I left it because I thought it wasn't democratic enough. Why should young people read or write history today? Well... <laughs> I think because it's fun, but that perhaps is not a very good reason for most people. I think it's useful to understand our society by understanding how one has got there. Well, you asked me about things that we could learn from the 17th century. I think it's useful to have some sort of idea of where the House of Lords and the monarchy came from and what their function has been in the past when one's criticizing them today. I mean, the the, the Civil War, I suppose, was fought as much as anything else over use of the royal prerogative to go behind the backs of Parliament, of the representative assembly. And one of the issues in politics today is use of the royal prerogative for secret service operations and things like that, all sorts of things which Parliament can't inquire into and which aren't democratically controlled because of the royal prerogative. These are spheres which can't be touched by, by Parliament. I think they ought to be controlled but, but by Parliament, and I think a little bit of looking at 17th century history will show some of the reasons for being distrustful of the arbitrariness inherent in a royal prerogative, not being subject to democratic control. Some of the things the royal prerogative does are harmless and unimportant. Others aren't, I think. In conversations with historians, John Miller has been talking to Professor Christopher Hill, formerly Master of Balliol College, Oxford, and an authority on the English Civil War.